dinner, we'll have worship with the Holy Trinity Baptist Church for their 70th church anniversary. Let's give our men and our music ministry, our praise team, a high clap of encouragement. We appreciate them for setting the atmosphere today. Uh, let us keep everyone in prayer that had prayer requests. We're also grateful we had a uh, thank you card from one of our college students, Elena Wirth, thanking us for the uh, card and the package that we sent out to our college students. Let us not forget to pray for our students while they are away at college. Many of them are returning this week to school, so let's keep them lifted up in our prayers. Amen. Bible study will resume upon tomorrow coming out of the book of James, I believe, chapter 4. So we hope to see you upon tomorrow evening for Bible study. I must say before I preach today, I'm so grateful for the leadership of this church. Let's just salute our leadership and give them a hand clap of appreciation. The first act that I did going into this new year, I asked for our trustees, deacons, preachers to join me here early this morning before church started, before Sunday school started, for us to pray together at the altar. And I felt that was very important because each and every one of us as leaders in this church, we're intelligent, we're smart, we have abilities within our human capacity. But I stated that we don't have the ability within our human capacity to lead Enon to where God wants us to be. We still need the filling in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need the Lord to lead and guide us. We need the Lord to keep us together. Amen. Amen. So periodically throughout the year, I'm going to be asking for the leadership of the church to join me in prayer. And I thank God because we, we had a great number this morning. Amen. Let's just thank God for our trustees, our deacons, our ministers. Amen. I said, we're going to be great. Amen. We're going to be great and we're going to be together. I told him I'm going to be like Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great made a statement to the Soviet Union, the Russians. He said that I'm going to take you into the new century together. If I have to take you kicking, dragging, and screaming, amen. Amen. So the leadership of this church, we're going to pray together, we're going to worship together, and we're going to go forward to where God would have us to go. Are you excited about where God is taking us as a church? Do you believe that God has even better things for us as a church family? Amen. So let us pray together. There is a word from the Lord today found in the Old Testament book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Joshua 3, verses 1 through 5. I'll be reading to you from the New King James Version. When you have it, say amen. Joshua chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priest, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know that way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I want to preach just for a few moments from this thought, uncharted territory. Uncharted territory. As you go to your seat, just look at someone and say, neighbor, we are about to go somewhere that we have not been before. Amen, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word today. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We pray that as your word comes forth, that the redeemed of the Lord would say so. We pray, dear God, that you would touch the heart of someone that needs to be saved, that needs to be restored, that needs to be covered by you and the church. And we pray, Lord, that someone will come giving their life unto you. And Lord, I pray that you'd stir up the gift and the anointing within me for, Lord, I need your presence and your power to help me to preach this word. And we pray that as the word comes forth, 
that the redeemed of the Lord would say so. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. Amen. Uncharted territory. The text today catapults us into the historical writings of Joshua and Eleazar. They chronicle the events from 1646 to 1616 B.C. in the life and the journey of Israel. Israel is still experiencing a season of transition from the leadership of Moses to the formation of the leadership of Joshua. The Lord has providentially allowed Israel to survive the wilderness, the internal and external struggles, the emotional death and demise of their leader, an attempted rebellion by those who wanted to forfeit the inheritance of the promised land and return to Egypt. Now Joshua has gathered his strength, his support, and embraced the vision of where the Lord is taking the nation of Israel. The text unfolds in a place called Shittim, which it was eight miles from the Jordan River. Eight miles from their place of promise they camped, so close but yet so far. They were close enough to Canaan to catch the morning breeze off of the Jordan River, which brought the scent of Canaan into their camp. Have you ever been at a point in your life of where you felt you were so close to your destiny, so, place, so close to the place that God has designed for you? They were eight miles from a physical and spiritual transformation, from being a wilderness and nomadic people to becoming that of a people of promise who were building a legacy. Eight miles, a short distance from God transforming them from people that did not have a place of their own into going into a place that God prepared for them. Eight miles, a short distance from being a wilderness people that had a wilderness mentality in order to be transformed into a people of promise with a promised land mentality. You do know that before God can take us somewhere, there must be a season of transition and transformation because the Lord does not intend for us to carry our Egypt into our Canaan. Look at somebody and say, he's preaching to you this morning. They were only eight miles from what they had known and become familiar with for 40 plus years to now going into uncharted territory where their feet had not tread, a place where they had not slumbered and surroundings that they had not yet experienced. What we learn from Israel at this juncture on their journey is that in order for us to get to all that the Lord has for us, we must there must be an interest in some uncharted territory. You cannot stay where you have always been and get what the Lord has for you. Let me say that one more time. You cannot always stay where you have always been and get what the Lord has for you. Sometimes in pursuing the Lord and his presence and his glory, it means that you must transition and transform from what has been comfortable into a place that God has designed for you. I don't know about you, Enon, but I'm glad that sometimes God saw fit to transition and transform me because there were some things that needed to be in my rear view mirror. There's some things that needed to stay in my past. There were some things in my past that were not fit for my future. There were some people that were fit for my past that were not fit for my future. So that meant that it had to be a season of shedding some things in order to get what God has for me. We can't remain where we've always been and expect the Lord to grant us different results. The providential power and authority of the Lord is so mighty that he could have blessed and prospered Israel while in Egypt or in the wilderness. However, his desire was to take them into a new uncharted place so that he could do something new in their lives without the stench and the residue of their past pain and associated, be associated with their future. You see, sometimes when God is taking us somewhere. He wants to take everything off of our past away from us in order for us to go into our new place with him so that nothing will be polluted. I, I wish I had someone in here that knows what it is to shed some things of your past. I often give an example sometimes in Bible study. Sometimes you look at the space shuttles and the rockets when they go into outer space they have what's called booster rockets. Help me engineers. And those booster rockets are designed to help the main rocket or the shuttle to get off of the ground 
ground and to propel into the air. But once it reaches a certain altitude, come on, somebody help me in here. Those booster rockets are designed to fall off of the shuttle because if they stay attached to the shuttle, then they will weigh it down and it will never get to its design place. What are you saying, Reverend? What I'm trying to say this morning is that we all have some booster rocket people and situations in our lives, but we have to understand that as we reach a certain point on our journey, some things and some folks have to fall out of our atmosphere so that we can get to where God wants us to be. Is there anyone in here that understands that God is taking you somewhere and you don't want anything from your past to hold you back? I don't know about you, but I'm glad that the Lord moved me from my place of former pain and struggle before he manifested his favor and glory into my life. I don't want my present blessings to have the residue of folks and stuff that are not fit for where God is taking me to in my life. Because I found out that sometimes the reason why we are not blessed and favored more in our life is because we carry residue from our past into our present. But God is telling someone that if you're going to cross your Jordan and get to where God wants you to go, you've got to walk into some uncharted territory and leave some old baggage behind. Do I have at least 50 folk in here that can say, Reverend, you're preaching to me this morning. You're stirring my Kool-Aid. You're in my mind. You're walking through my house because God has been telling me I need to leave some things behind in order to get to where God wants me to be. My 1985, 95, 75, 65, my 2005 has nothing to do with my 2000 2017. I wish I had about 30 folk in here because I understand that God is doing something great in my life and if he's going to do it, I've got to leave some things behind. As a matter of fact, someone ought to clap for yourself right now because you just realized that the Lord told you to get some distance and disconnect from some people and some stuff that have tried to hinder your destiny and your promise. Those haters, those manipulators, those phony friends, those who attempt to obstruct your vision and your faith, those that will try to borrow your blessings before you can enjoy them yourself. God said this is a time and a season that before you go into uncharted territory, you've got to get rid of some stuff because God wants to do more in your life. Is there anyone in here that believes that God is up to something in your life. You don't know what's about to happen, but you know that you're about to cross in to some uncharted territory. You don't know why he's about to bless you, but you know he's going to bless you because you're going into some uncharted territory. You've been trying to figure out why your circles of friends have changed, why you don't feel the same way about some things and some folks, but God is telling you that you're about to cross over into some uncharted territory. You don't know why that now that some folks that have been your running buddies are getting on your nerves, it's because you're about to cross the Jordan and go into some uncharted territory. You feel something in your pocket. You feel money about to come. You feel honey about to come. You feel peace about to come. All because God is about to take you into uncharted territory. So I stopped by this morning to let someone know, don't get comfortable with where you've been for the last year, five years, ten years, or fifteen years, but God is about to take you somewhere. Someone shout somewhere. Here is what I like about the Old Testament narrative is the Lord has Israel on the move. Anytime the Lord elevates your life, you cannot stay stagnant and stationary. Rather, you have to be on the move. Even though Israel left Egypt and was heading toward the promised land, there is no record in 40 years that they remained in the same place. Even though they were in the wilderness, they were still walking closer to their destiny. They were going zigging and zagging, but they were still on the move. They did not stay in the same place for any length of time. So the relevant question that we must ask ourselves is why are we staying in the same place and unwilling to go into uncharted territory? You've been mad for 20 years. When are you going to stop being mad? You've been broken for 30 years. How long are you going to be broken? You've been tore up from the floor for a long time. When are you going to get blessed and delivered? You've been depressed for a long time. You better realize the Lord is on your side. Do I have anyone in here that has your mind made up this morning that you are about to move into uncharted territory? Where you have been has been good for a while, but you believe that God has more and better for you. You can't stay where you've always been. Surround yourself with folks that you've always been with. 
You can't be influenced in your place of promise by those that are connected with your Egypt and your wilderness experience. You need to get some promised land people in your life. You need some people in your atmosphere that are not going to speak doom, gloom, death, and destruction. But you need some folks that will whisper in your ear that you are made in the image of God. You need some folks that will whisper in your ear and tell you that the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want. You need some folks that will speak into your atmosphere that you are the head and not the tail. You need some folks to speak into your life that you are highly favored and you are highly blessed. You need some folks that will speak in your life and tell you that the things of yesterday are no more and you're walking into your today. You need some folks in your life that will say the Lord is in the process of opening the windows of heaven and pouring you out a blessing that you shall not have room enough to receive it. You don't need any folks in your atmosphere and your life that are going to keep talking about limitations and what God cannot do because we serve a big God that is able to bless us abundantly. Is there anyone in here that believes that God is taking you somewhere? You can't go somewhere if you always have wilderness and Egypt people in your life. Let me prove my point biblically because you're looking at me funny. As a matter of fact, if we really exegete the historical context of the scripture before Israel could get into the land of promise, the Lord in his providence took those wilderness and Egyptian folks out of their lives. The Bible says that they were called the children of Korah that went along for the ride, but they were always rebellious. They were always naysaying. They were always stirring up something. I wish I had somebody in it because I feel like preaching. And the Bible says that they reached a jungle in their movement through the wilderness when they were about to descend into the land of promise but the Lord opened up the earth and the Bible says that the earth swallowed them up because of their rebellion and they were not fit to move into the land of promise so that means that you have a choice to make in your life either you're going to sink down with the children of Korah and go into the death or you're going to get up and disconnect yourself and walk into your promise I have learned to say in my 45 years I have some folks I love. They're my friends. They're my ace boons. They run with me for many years, but they are not fit for my journey. And where God is taking me, I'm not going to miss what God has for me for nobody down here. Is there anybody, anybody, anybody in here that can say, Preacher, you're short enough preaching to me because 2017 is a year of purging in my life. I've been through too much to forfeit my journey now. I wish I had someone that could go down memory lane when you didn't have nothing but crackers and soda water, when you were living on government commodities, when you were trying to work your way through school, when you were trying to raise your children by yourself, why are you going to mess up your blessings right now after God has brought you through all of that? You ought to shake the dust off of you, shake somebody off of you, and say, my God, I'm going to get everything that God has for me. You done survived everything. And now you're going to mess up your blessings because you can't cut boo-boo the fool loose. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. Pray for me, Deacon Chess. I'm sorry. As we exegete the text today, we find some very valid principles about the movement of Israel into the place of promise that are applicable to our journey in the kingdom. We discover that as they go into their place of promise, they didn't go in just any kind of way. There was some structure for how they went in to the land of promise. They went into their place of promise with a spirit and methodology of excellence. Someone say excellence. They didn't just wake up in the morning and say, let's walk into Canaan. Rather, they went in a certain way so they could give honor unto the Lord for their journey and so that they would process into the, in the way that was reflective of their relationship with the Lord. In other words, they were not lazy about how they walked into their blessings. They went in a certain kind of way because they realized that God had brought them over and brought them through. So now they had determined in their spirit that we're going to walk in a way of excellence because we know what God has for us today. 
That is the problem that many of us have in the kingdoms that we want the Lord to take us to a place of promise. However, when we get there to the boundaries of the promise, we want to walk in any old kind of way. But let me tell you something. When I walk into the Lord's house, I'm already prayed up. I'm already worshipped up. I'm already praised up. I done sang myself happy. Amen. I just realized all these preachers in Eden sing except me. Amen. But I sing at home. Amen. And I sing myself happy because when I get here, I look for the manifestation of what the Lord has already showed me before I got here. I come in with a spirit of excellence and anticipation. I'm going to serve him a certain kind of way. I'm going to worship him a certain kind of way. I'm going to work in the kingdom a certain kind of way because I know what God is about to do in my life. Come here, Israel. Israel went into Canaan and the Bible says that they went in a certain way. May I exegete my text for just a moment? Joshua called for the priest and the Levites to come first bearing the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the spirit and the presence of the Lord. So watch this. This means that they did not get ahead of God. They did not try to tell God, God, we know how to walk into Canaan. It's only eight miles. We can walk there by ourselves. I have a degree. I have ability. I can walk myself. But no, they said, bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So that means they had enough sense to understand that they had survived the wilderness, but they were not about to walk into their victory and their promise unless the Lord led them first. You see, that's what we have to learn in life is that we need the presence of the Lord to go before us. And maybe I'm just young and not Eve, but I have learned that when the presence of the Lord goes before me, that the Lord will work out some things on my behalf. Do I have any witnesses in here that can say you woke up one morning and you were troubled about what was ahead of you, but you decided to send the presence of the Lord before you and you followed the Lord. And when you followed him, he worked some things out in your life. As a matter of fact, some of us could be a walking, breathing advertisement this morning to say that the Lord in his presence had worked some things out in our our lives because if it had not been for the presence of the Lord going before us we wouldn't have our joy we wouldn't have our healing we wouldn't have our victory we would have lost our mind a long time ago someone might have even been locked up in a jail cell but aren't you glad that somewhere in your life you said Lord I need you to go in front of me and Lord if you go in front of me I know that you're going to order my steps is there anybody in here that knows that we need the presence of the Lord in front of us. That's why somebody said, I need the presence of the Lord. They were instructed, they were instructed to wait until the ark had gotten 2,000 cubits ahead of them. And then they would follow the ark. They would be about 4,166 feet and 8 inches, or roughly about the fourth of a mile. They did this for a reason, because as they went into uncharted territory, they knew that it was imperative that they were in a grand processional of the nation, and that they had the ability to see the presence of the Lord. You see, the problem that some folks have in the body of why they don't get delivered is that they come into the church, and they try to walk to their place of the promise, but they're not able to see the presence presence of the Lord because we are in the way. They see folks before they see the Lord. Somebody say preach Macrinos. That's why I don't care about you coming in here and seeing me. I want you to see the Lord because I can't deliver anyone but the Lord can deliver. I can't save anyone but the Lord can save someone. So the church is not about us but it's about seeing him. Is there anyone in here that can say yes I'm glad today that when I came into the house of the Lord I saw the Lord. How I am lifted up. I saw the presence of the Lord. And there's something special about just coming into the presence of the Lord. Because when you come into his presence, he'll work some things out in your life. Is there anyone in here that's ever had that special time with the Lord? Where he said, Lord, I just want to come into your presence. I just want to call on your name. I just want to pray to you and talk to you. And you can't explain it. You don't know how to define it. But when you came into the presence of the Lord, he worked work some things out in your life. I want to give you an advertisement because I wouldn't be who I am today if I had not been in the presence of the Lord because when I came into his presence, he worked some things out in my life. I'm not self-made like some folks. Some folks are at a point in their lives where they don't need the presence of the Lord, so they say. Do I have any witnesses in here? 
but I need his presence with me. You see, when we look at the text, the only person that needed to be seen was Joshua as he was leading them in the direction of the Lord. As the priests and Levites saw Joshua, they made sure the presence of the Lord was with him, and the people had to follow Joshua and his presence in order to get to the place of promise. This is why some churches get messed up. Some folks are trying to lead from the choir stand, lead from the church board, trying to lead from the minister's pew, trying to lead from the basement, but we need to let the Lord get in front of the church. Somebody say, preach, Macri. You know, Man, they fail to attempt to attain the promises of the Lord uh, because we don't allow the Lord to get in front of us. Uh, and then we never make it into uncharted territory. But I want you to understand today that the reason why I'm going to get to where God wants me to go is because I'm going to let the presence of the Lord go before me. Now come on and help me for just a few moments and we're going to get out of here because I believe today that if we just put the Lord in front of us, uh, that the Lord is going to lead us somewhere. Look at somebody and say, we're going somewhere. I believe today uh, that if we just let the presence of the Lord uh, get in front of us, uh, he will work some things out that need to be worked out. Uh, he will straighten out some crooked ways. Uh, he will pick up some bowed down heads. Uh, he will reform the wretched. Uh, he will save the lost uh, if we just let the Lord get in front of us. Uh, and I believe today uh, that the Lord wants to do a work in our lives uh, just like he did in the life of Israel. Uh, but here's what I like about the text as I prepare to close. Not only did they cross over into a bunch of territory and the land of promise, but the Bible says that Joshua told the nation that we have not passed this way before. But watch this. Because they had not passed this way before, he told them to do one unique thing. He said, Joshua said unto the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among us. What did it mean to sanctify? yourselves. When we look into the context of the scripture, it says that as Israel was preparing to walk into the place of promise, as they were preparing to walk into uncharted territory, that they began to cleanse themselves of their impurities, that they began to cleanse and wash themselves because they didn't want the dust of Egypt and the wilderness to go into a place of promise. Well, what are you trying to say, preacher? What I'm trying to say is that sometimes the only thing that that stands between us and our place of promise uh, is us uh, sanctifying and cleansing ourselves. Uh, in other words, uh, it's nothing but old-fashioned repentance. Uh, that's why the Bible said, if my people uh, that are called by my name uh, would humble themselves and pray uh, and turn from their wicked ways, uh, then I will hear from heaven uh, and I will heal the land. Uh, is there anybody in here that wants to get to your place of promise? Uh, do you believe that the Lord has some Something great for you where well, sometimes all you've got to do uh, is just sanctify and cleanse yourself uh, because I believe today uh, that if we just cleanse ourselves, uh, that the Lord will do wonders among us. Uh, that's why Joshua said uh, that this day uh, that he shall do wonders among us. Uh, is there anybody in here that wants the Lord to do a wonder in your life? Uh, you didn't come to church to leave the same way. Uh, you haven't been praying to stay bound and afflicted. You haven't been in the word to stay sick but you believe that the Lord will do some wonders in your life. Come on in here Holy Spirit because I believe today that this might be the year of wonders in somebody's life. If you just have the audacity to walk into some uncharted territory you see sometimes you've got to get up from where you've always been and move to where God is trying to take you. Is there anybody here that can say, I feel the Lord telling me that it's time to move. I've been living this way too long. I've been struggling too long. I've been broken too long. I've been sick too long. I've been dysfunctional too long. But this is my time to move. If you have just a little bit of faith in your spirit, you ought to just jump to your feet and begin to move. 
the season to move a little bit higher. This is my season to walk into my place of promise. This is my season to walk into brand new mercies. This is my season to move into greater wonders. This is my season to walk into a greater anointing. Look at somebody and say, he's preaching about me. Take a good look at me right now because God is doing something in my life. Take a good look at me right now because he's healing my family. Take a good look at me now. He's elevating me on my job. Take a good look at me now. He's putting me back together again. Some of you have been like Humpty Dumpty. They said Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty back together again. But don't you, aren't you glad today that you're not dependent on man to put you back together again? Because somebody can say, Father, I stretch my hands unto thee. No other help I know. If thou wilt draw thyself from me, where shall I go? Somebody say, it's about to happen in my life. I'm moving into uncharted territory and the Lord is about to bless me real good. Well, how do you know he's going to bless you? Because the Bible says that my Savior Jesus died for my sins. He got up from the grave and has all power in heaven and in earth in my hands. And if he has all power, then I believe that he'll do wonders in my life wonders how many of you need the Lord to do a wonder in your life just hold your hand up where I can see it if you need him to do a wonder in your life no matter what it is a family wonder a financial wonder a marital wonder a vocational wonder let the Lord see that you need a move that you need a wonder in your life. Now let me challenge you this morning as I open the doors of the church. If you just held your hand up and said you need a wonder, but you've never accepted him as Lord and Savior. You've been out of the church more than 90 days. You need a church home. 